Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks, Nanopar, for the invitation. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, best practices to get a uh, high throughput on uh, Nanopar technology. And in a, in a second part, I will uh, present you two new reference genome for the model plant Arabidopsis saliana. So let's begin by the first part about best practices. So here is a workflow for the 1D library prep with GDNA. And I will follow this workflow and go into more detail for each step. So the first step is to control the quality of your DNA. So it's very important to work with very pure DNA for two reasons. The first one is impurities can reduce the efficiency of the enzymatic reaction during the library preparation. And also, they can uh, reduce the lifetime of the pores. So that's why ultra-pure DNA is required. So the best way to assess the, quality, the purity of a DNA is to use a nanodrop. So here you have two samples analyzed with a nanodrop. The first one is a very dirty DNA with a contaminant that absorbs at 230 nanometers. And the second one is a very clean DNA that, that is suitable for nanopore sequencing. So it's very important to have a good ratios. And also to keep in mind that the nanodrop is not very accurate for low concentration. But you have to be very careful with the nanodrop because there are some contaminants that absorb at 260 nanometers. So as a, and they can improve, increase the two ratios. So here you have an example of a GDNA contaminated with RNA. And as you can see, there is a, the two ratios are good, but there is a big uh, shift between the nanodrop and the qubit concentration. And after RNA treatment, you can see the two concentrations are very close, but the 230 ratio is not good anymore. So it is very important to have good ratios, but also to have a close, close concentration between the nanodrop and the and a fluorescence-based method, like the qubit uh, or the pico green. And you have to, and you need to have a, a factor less uh, than of two. So another important control is to to check the integrity of the DNA. For the input material, of course, if you don't have uh, long DNA molecules, you won't get long reads. And for the library, it's very important to accurately assess the mean size of your library to convert the DNA mass into a number of molecules and to always put the same number of molecules as input for your library prep. So here are four devices. The first one is a chief mapper, with it, which is actually the golden standard. It's a pulse field uh, electrophoresis system. <coughs> the second one is a pipin pulse, an inverted electrophoresis system. And the two last ones are the femtopulse and the fragment analyzer, two capillary electrophoresis system. And I will compare these four, these four devices for three kinds of samples, a 25 KB and a 40 KB shared DNA and an unshared DNA. So for the 25 KB DNA, you can see a smear from 10 to 40 KB on the chief mapper. The same for the pipin pulse, and a mean size of uh, around uh, 25 KB for the fragment analyzer and the femtopulse. So all these four devices are good to assess this kind of sample. It's the same for a 40 KB DNA. You have a smear from 15 to 50 KB with the chief mapper, the same for the pipin pulse and an average size of around 40 KB with the fragment and the femtopulse. But for an unshared DNA that runs from 20 KB to 150 KB, you can see an accumulation of DNA at 100 KB with a pipin pulse, which is actually the upper limit of this de device. For the fragment analyzer, you have a clear underestimation of the size with an average size of only 53 KB. And with the femtopulse, you have a signal from 20 KB to 150 KB that is close to what we have with uh, the chief mapper. So to summarize, the femtopulse appears to be the, the best trade-off with a runtime of around two, three hours, uh, a low requirement of DNA, and also a good resolution up to 150 KB. But the only negative point could be the the price of this device, which is around uh, 
$80K. So here I want to show you a DNA extraction protocol we developed for the Sunflower Genome Project. And as you can see, this protocol works well with cells or bacteria. And you can get uh, a DNA from 20 KB to 150 KB and even more with cells. And there are also other protocols that are available on this website, protocols.io, where you can find a Minion user group uh, which is held by uh, Benjamin Schwesinger. So now let's go into the, the library preparation with the first step, which is uh, DNA sharing. So it's uh, an optional step, but uh, as you can see, sharing the DNA can increase the throughput. I have some hypotheses about uh, it, but I don't want to go into more detail now, and if you want, we can discuss about it uh, after. So there are two main devices to share the DNA, the G-tube and the Megarator. With the G-tube, you have a wider distribution than with the Megarator, probably because there is only one round of shearing, whereas with the Megarator, you have a 15 uh, round of shearing. The price of, uh, for, for one sample with the G-tube is uh, around uh, 30 euro, but you only need a centrifuge, whereas with the Megarator, the price is only 10 euros, but you need to buy the device for around 18k dollars. So maybe as we saw before, the long molecules seem to be, seem to be less efficient in the library prep. So maybe the use of the Megaruptor allows to get a tighter distribution and therefore a more efficient library preparation. The next step is uh, the blue pipin step. So it is also an optional step, and usually the blue pipin is used to remove short fragments. But here I want to point out another use of the blue pipin, which is to purify a sample, and here a, a plain sample. So without a blue pipin step, you can see the purity of the DNA is not so bad with a 230 ratio close to 2. But after five minutes of sequencing, we have only 143 pores that are working. Whereas we, there were uh, almost uh, 500 uh, active pores in the MUX1. But uh, when we add the blue pipin step in our library prep, you can see a big improvement of the purity with a 230 ratio close to 2.3. And uh, also, after five minutes of sequencing, there are 337 pores that are working and uh, still uh, 500 uh, pores in the MUX1. And if we, we look at the throughput, the yield, we got uh, six gigabases with the, uh, the blue pipin and only four gigabases with, uh, without the blue pipin. So as you can see, the blue pipin can improve the purity of your sample and also increase the yield. So the next uh, two steps are the DNA repair and the, and the end prep. But for these steps, I just uh, followed the standard protocol. So let's move on to the adapter ligation. So here it's a graph I took from NIB website. And I think it's a good illustration that uh, it's very important to have an excess of, ad of adapters over the DNA molecules. So as you can see, with a 2.5 uh, excess of adapters, you have only between uh, 15, 50 and 60% of uh, product with two adapters. But when we use an excess of uh, fivefold or more, you have uh, between 70 and 80 percent of the products with uh, two adapters. So it is very important to not overload this uh, ligation reaction. And we found that 0 0.2 picomoles of DNA molecule into the ligation step, the so ligation reaction, appears to be optimal, at least for 8 KB and the 20 KB libraries. So the last step is to load the flow cell. So unlike other sequencing platforms, overloading and saturation is good for two reasons. The first one is the lifetime of an empty pore is higher than uh, uh, the lifetime of an, an empty pore. The sequencing pore is higher than the, the lifetime of an empty pore. And the second reason is, of course, more pores that are sequencing at the same time will result in a higher throughput. 
And there is a very important parameter that is the occupancy, which is defined by the number of sequencing pore, uh, so the strand pore, di divided by the number of available pores, so the single plus the strand pores. And this parameter should be above high, uh, 80%. So here is the first flow cell loaded with a 45 femtomoles of a 20 KB library. And as you can see, the occupancy is only 65%. But when we load twice more library of the same library, you can reach uh, an occupancy of 80%. So it is very important to load a large amount of library in order to saturate the flow cell. So here it's uh, what we think is a, an optimal, uh, the optimal uh, protocol for a 20 KB library. So we start with three micrograms of DNA shared at uh, 20 KB. And at the end, we load the 1.2 micrograms of DNA onto the flow cell. But what I want to point out here is uh, it's very important to have uh, high recoveries from impure purification. That's why we increase the binding time to 20 minutes and the elution time to 10 minutes on a rotator. And if we, uh, we get a lower recovery, it's probably that your DNA is not pure or too large. And also, it's normal to have a lower recovery for the last step because the beads are washed with a ABB buffer instead of ethanol. So now look at the, the results. We we got with uh, this protocol. Uh, so with uh, about the yield for the, our last four runs, we got uh, more than uh, 12 gigabases, and the best one is close to 16 gigabases. So with the such throughput, we can put uh, 12 samples on the same flow cell. So in red, you have the amount of data, and you can see about 25% uh, of the data are not assigned to a barcode but uh, we still have uh, more than 0 0.5 gigabases of data for each sample. And about the read length, we have uh, a mean read length uh, between 10 and 16 KB for each sample <coughs> without size selection. So now let's move on to the second part about uh, new genomes, reference genomes of Arabidopsis thaliana. So we produced the first assembly for a first uh, genotype. So we produced uh, 10 gigabases in two flow cells. That represents uh, 77x of data, and half of the data are above uh, 14 KB. So after filtering at Q9 and uh, error correction with uh, Canu, we made the assembly with Smart De Novo. And the size of the assembly is uh, close to 120 megabases. That is very close to the expected uh, genome size for, for this species. And what is very impressive is only is 90% uh, of the assembly is contained in only uh, 18 uh, contigs. So we have very large contigs. And when we compare this new nanopore genome with a reference genome made with sequence, uh, Sanger sequencing, you can see a perfect collinearity all along the genome, at least uh, at a chromosome scale. So we also produced uh, another uh, assembly for another accession, but this time we started only with five gigabases that represent uh, 38 X of data. And after filtering and error correction with Canu, we got a very similar matrix with uh, 80, 90% of the, the assembly in only 24 contigs. So it is very interesting to see that uh, with half of the data compared with the first uh, genome, we have the same matrix. And for this accession, we have, uh, th there was an inversion that was uh, suspected on the chromosome three. And when we compare this uh, new nanopore genome with the reference genome, you can clearly see this inversion of two megabases on the chromosome three as expected. So this high quality genome allows to detect a large structural variations. And to finish, I want to thank the core facility GetPlage of Toulouse 
and especially Cécile Donadieu, Catherine Zanqueta, and Maxime Mano. For the IPM, Jérôme Gouzi, for the anal bioinformatic analysis, and also Fabrice Roux, the leader of my team. And uh, the CNRGV and the Genotool bioinformatic uh, platform. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Baptiste. Merci beaucoup. Uh, we have time for maybe one one question. Taco, can you do just one question? Yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, Let, hold on, hold on. Let's wait for the mic. Thank you. A uh, very nice overview in all details. Uh, I may have missed it, but uh, have you assessed the differences between uh, 9.4 and 9.5 uh, flow cells? And uh, what's your opinion on the difference? We are only working with uh, 9.4 flow cells. Only 9.4? We have because we are working with 1D kit. And for 1D kit, yeah. uh, 9.4 flow cells are working better. Thanks. So, yeah. Right, so one more. <laughs> Alex? Yeah. Oh, oops. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your presentation. So uh, you shared an optimized protocol, right? So uh, you said you want to overload the flu cell because it, it can generate more data. So in this case, do you increase the adapter amount and the reagent amount accordingly? If I increase the adapter amount? Uh, because you increased your input DNA amount. So do you increase adapter amount? No. No. Uh, no. You use the, I use the same yeah. as the protocol. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. But in this case, I'm worried about maybe you can increase the uh, the DNA sequence without adapters or with one single adapter. Sorry. So in this case, there may be some reads with only one adapter or without the adapter. I, I'm not sure to understand the question. Uh, anyway, I'll talk to okay. you after the presentation. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. One one question for Alex. Very nice results indeed. Uh, in respect to the, the yield indeed, so you really can now get t above 10 gigabases in each run you have, as long as you have done all the QCs you mentioned, or is there still also a vari variability in the technology or in the consumables you get from O&T? Uh, so, so about the... The yield, so the the yield? Is, is each and every run, as long as it's... For uh, bacteria, it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, You get 10 gigs. Yeah, okay. I, nice. routinely, yes. For plants, it's between uh, 4 and 6 gigabases. But I think we have to improve the purity. It's purity related, you think? Yeah, it? I think. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. And <laughs> with that, we'll conclude that session. Thank you very much, Baptiste. Merci.